In this video, you'll be learning the exact workflow used to make this looping animation, combining frame-by-frame -frame animation in Adobe Animate, 3D renders in Cinema 4D, and compositing techniques in Adobe After Effects. Hi, I'm Bo Ryan, a 3D motion designer living out of Alberta, Canada, and also a TA for Animation Bootcamp at School of Motion. And I'm Andrew Marston, a primarily 2D motion designer and animator based in Arizona, United States. And I'm also a TA at School of Motion, usually for the advanced motion course and occasionally for Animation Bootcamp. In this video, you'll learn how to quickly create a 3D reference animation in After Effects, the basics of cell animation or frame-by-frame -frame animation in Adobe Animate using our 3D reference, importing an After Effects file into Cinema 4D, modeling and rendering the bottle out of Cinema 4D, and then compositing it back into After Effects. We're going to start by creating a reference animation in After Effects as efficiently as possible that everything else will be based on. And we're doing this for two main reasons. The first is that it ensures the cell animation and the Cinema 4D renders will line up perfectly when we composite them together at the end in After Effects. And the second reason is that it gives us a useful guide that we can literally draw on top of in Adobe Animate when doing the frame by frame section of this project. Now, it sort of feels like cheating, but creating a drawing aid like this, in my opinion, is perfectly fine because drawing 3D objects in motion frame by frame while trying to maintain their volume and the perspective and the depth and everything is really difficult. So any help you can give yourself like creating a reference animation is totally fine in my book. So let's dive into After Effects and create that reference animation. So this is the actual rough animation that I created for the project that Bo and I ended up creating. And you can see that it's essentially made up of two main parts. We have these two cylinders that represent a crude drinking vessel. And then we also have these guides here that I added only for the cell animation. And you can see that there are some hash marks above and also below the surface of where the liquid should be. And these are so that visually while animating frame by frame in Adobe Animate, I can tell how high or how low the liquid is sloshing as the container revolves. So everything you see on the screen is actually created the same way, extracting geometry from shape layers in After Effects, which I'm going to show you right now by creating just these two cylinders. Then hopefully you'll get the idea and could carry it as far as you like. So we're going to create a new composition. I'll call this Potions Rough Example, 1920 by 1920, 12 frames per second, three seconds long. Of course, these settings are correct because I was practicing this before I hit record. And now in this brand new comp, we're going to create an ellipse. And if you just double click on the shape tools, it will create that shape that is the same uh, height and width as your composition. And then quickly, we're gonna resize this because it's too big in the properties panel. We'll make it 900 by 900. And then we'll make this a 3D layer by clicking on this 3D switch. And right now our geometry options, which are what we need, are grayed out. And that's because we are using the classic 3D renderer in After Effects. And what we need is the Cinema 4D renderer. And as soon as we switch to Cinema 4D, boom, these geometry options are now available. And that's what we want. We want this extrusion depth. And if I drag this, it looks like nothing's happening because I skipped a step. We need to rotate this so it looks like it's sitting flat. So what I like to do is hit Control shift alt y to create a new null. I'm going to enable this to be a 3D null, and then I'm going to parent our shape layer to our null. And now it will hit R to reveal the rotation properties of that null, and now I'm going to put the R rotation at 90. And now we can see that our ellipse is sitting flat. So when we extrude it, we'll actually be able to see that. So we're gonna select our shape layer one, which I'm gonna rename because it's good to rename layers. We'll call it circle outside because we'll have a circle inside. I'm gonna select that, hit control F and type in extrusion. So we get extrusion depth. And as I drag this to the right, we can see, if I turn off my stroke, because my stroke is black, we can see that we are extruding the geometry from that ellipse. If we look back at what I had created before, we have this inner cylinder, which is pretty easy. I'm just gonna select our circle outside shape layer, hit Control D to duplicate. I'm gonna rename that circle inside, and I'm gonna bring the 
size of that down. And we can see that something's happening on screen, but I believe I just need to turn down the opacity here. Yeah, we'll set it to 50. Now we can see the inside and the outside. I'm gonna turn the extrusion down. This is where you can adjust to taste how you want your look to be if you're making something similar. So I'm gonna rename this null to control, call this tilt. Then I'm gonna duplicate it and this will be control spin. We're gonna parent our tilt control null to our control spin layer. And as the name implies, we're gonna use this first null to tilt the axis of this cylinder, just like this, maybe a little bit more. And then on the control spin null, I'm gonna hit R to reveal the rotation controls and set a keyframe at frame zero on the Z axis. Let's go to two seconds right here. And I'm gonna put in, can't remember if I needed negative one or one. I'll try negative one. And I'm also gonna trim my work area to one frame before the end. And I'm gonna hit N on my keyboard for the end, to set the end of the work area. So now this will loop and hopefully seamlessly. So what we did was we offset the tilt using one null, but we used a different null to create the actual spin rotation. And now the only thing left to do is ease this animation. So I'm gonna select these two keyframes, hit F9 and then Shift F3 to open the graph editor, or you could just click the graph editor button, select the Z rotation. And right now our animation is okay, but it kind of comes to a stop when it's facing us. And the actual animation looks a little bit out of the box. I really want this to be a little more custom so it sort of sloshes one direction more than the other and it never fully stops. So we're gonna drag both of these handles off of their respective baselines. I'm gonna drag one a little bit more extreme towards the other. So now we can see, since this is the value graph and steepness equals the speed of the animation, that the fastest point in our animation is a little bit after the halfway point. So this is gonna end up with a slightly asymmetrical rotation. If I play this, you'll see what I mean. Sort of perfect. Uh, sound effects always help on animating. So this is how I went about creating this quick rough animation. To add the actual guides here, these are just small circles that I extruded and then positioned all linked to the same uh, tilt, or in this one I called it the axis shift, but they're all linked to the same tilt null. Now that the animation's complete, the only things left to do are render out an MP4 so that we can import that and draw on top of it to create the liquid frame-by-frame -frame animation in Adobe Animate, and also save and send this After Effects file to Bo, and he will extract the data he needs to create the model in Cinema 4D. You can render out an MP4 from After Effects under File, Export, Add to Render Queue, click on your output module name, and then under format, switch it to H264. In this case, the default settings are fine because this is just for reference. And then you would click render. Personally, shout out to the Anubis extension by Battle Axe. It's just a one click process, everything I just described. And then it renders an MP4 and opens the folder in your Explorer or Finder. Now we will send the After Effects file to Bo and I will get started doing the frame by frame in Adobe Animate. All right, here we are in Adobe Animate and we're looking at the final liquid surface animation that we used in the project with Bo. Now, for this section of the video, I'm not going to redraw this whole animation in front of you. That'd be super boring, but I am gonna give you a quick crash course so that you could get started doing frame by frame in Animate on your own and then go over how I created this using the reference video from After Effects. So. Buckle up, it's crash course time. So we're gonna need a new file, file new, and you can have multiple projects open at the same time in Animate. We're gonna enter the dimensions of our frame. In this case, we want 1920 by 1920. Our frame rate is 12 for this project. And I'm gonna ignore platform type because we're not doing any coding in this project at all. So I'm gonna hold control and scroll wheel back so we can see our whole stage. This is called the stage. It's basically your comp window. If you're familiar with After Effects, everything in this white square is what's going to be rendered when you create your animation at the end. 
And down at the bottom of the UI, we have the timeline panel, which is very similar to After Effects and Premiere. You can add new layers with the plus button. You can trash them with the trash button. You can group them into folders. If you want to hide a layer, you can click the eye icon here. And I think it would be most useful to do a quick demo animation and you can see how this process works. So I'm going to select the first keyframe and you'll notice that it, it is a little bit dim with a hollow circle at the bottom. I'm going to select that. Make sure my brush tool is selected and I'm going to draw a circle on that. And as soon as I did that keyframe or that frame became a lot lighter with a filled in circle. That filled in circle at the bottom of the frame means that it's a keyframe that has content. Before it was a keyframe without content and was hollow. So our goal is to move this circle over to the right side of the stage in we'll say about half a second or six frames in this case. I'm gonna undo that till we just have our circle. But we only have one frame in our animation right now. To get more frames, I'm gonna select that first frame and hit F5. F5 inserts frames. And I hit that five times, so now our animation is six frames long. With that six frame selected, I'm gonna hit F6, and that creates a new keyframe using all the content that was already on the stage. I'm gonna use my selection tool, the shortcut for that is V, I'm gonna move this circle over to the right side of the stage. So let's go ahead and preview that. You can hit play or the shortcut for that is enter. And if we want this to loop, we can click the loop button and then select the range of frames that we want to loop. In this case, it will just be the whole range. Perfect, this is a beautiful animation, print it. Obviously, we need a few more frames. So let's backtrack to frame three and I'm going ahead and behind in the timeline using the comma and period keys. With frame three selected, I'm gonna hit F6, and then I'm going to drag this roughly in the middle, but it's hard to tell exactly where this should be placed. Thankfully, there's a feature in an animate called onion skin, and if we click that onion skin button, you can see that now there are ghosts of the frames ahead and behind our current frame to use as reference. It looks like we actually did a pretty good job getting this in the middle. I'm gonna hit Q, which is your transform shortcut, I'm gonna drag this to be a little bit squashier, a little bit stretchier, perfect. And on frame number two, if I hit comma, we'll go back one frame. I'm gonna select that and hit F6, which creates a new keyframe using the same content that was on the stage. And I'm gonna drag this in between the content of frames one and frame three. I'm gonna squash this a little bit less than before, stretch it a little bit, but not too much. Now let's go fill in the rest of the frames. I'm gonna use the period key to navigate forward to frame four. And for the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna hit F7 instead of F6. F6 will create a new keyframe with the current content that's on the stage. F7 creates a completely blank keyframe with new content. I'm gonna hit B to activate my brush tool. And I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna hit control and zoom in a little bit. I'm gonna draw roughly where I want this to be. We'll put it right there, see how that works. Use the period key to go forward one keyframe, hit F6, V to get my selection tool, draw a box around the content, move it over a little bit. I'm gonna hit Q so I can unstretch that, unsquash that just a bit. And I'm gonna turn off onion skinning and we can take a look at the animation we made. So obviously this is just a crude demonstration but hopefully you get the idea. One other tip is that it's really helpful to create guide layers for you to reference while you're animating. So for example, if I create a new layer, I'm gonna double click the layer name and rename it guide. And then I'm gonna select a different color from the swatches panel over here on the right hand side of the UI. I'll select green. And on that guide layer, I'm gonna draw the motion path that I would like that circle to follow as it animates, as well as make tick marks to represent where the center of it should be at each frame. And creating aids for yourself like this to help keep track of where objects should be at each frame is extremely valuable and time-saving as you animate frame by frame. So jumping back into this final animation I did, if I turn on my rough passive animation, which is very crude and quick just to get the general motion down, and I tried to keep track of the peak and low point of that sloshing liquid surface using the tick marks on these guides. We can see that right now we are crossing right at the second from the top tick mark. And if we progress a few frames further, now we are at the top tick mark. And so using these guides, I was able to more easily keep track of how quickly that liquid surface was moving up and down 
as the glass revolved. On top of the rough pass, now that I know basically how the plane of the liquid is going to move, I did a clean pass. And in this clean pass, this is where I was, I took much more time and drew that, like the wave S curve that moves across as the glass revolves. And I would recommend doing your clean pass as outlines, duplicating those outlines once you're happy with them and filling them in on the duplicate layer, which is um, not what I did here. And lastly, after I was happy with how the clean pass looked, I went in and added a few secondaries, which are these splashes as the main mass of the liquid encounters the side of the glass. And these are just real quick. If, you, if we zoom in, you can see that these are not that complicated at all. We'll go frame by frame here. There's four frames for that secondary and moving over one, two, three, four frames for that secondary. So they're very quick to do, but I think secondaries are really what helps sell an animation. And if I disable the rough and guide layers, you can see the final animation that I exported as a PNG sequence to be composited in After Effects. Okay, so now we have Andrew's After Effects file with the three reference animation, but we need to move it into Cinema 4D. So there's a couple of small things to think about before we get here. Cinema 4D will recognize all the scene settings, so frame rate, size, everything like that. The one thing it doesn't do is if you trim the conf length here for the work area, it doesn't recognize that. So we need to quickly change that from three seconds to two seconds. So we're gonna go up to the composition window and go to composition settings, go down to the duration and change it to two seconds. So that is easy enough. The next thing we need is we just need to see what we actually want because Cinema 4D is gonna make a lot of different nulls for all these objects. So we really wanna try and minimize what we can here. And I think we need these bottom objects here and the, and the rotation nulls, everything else we can delete. So we're gonna go ahead and delete those and then just check for shy layers here because it will recognize those two. So let's go ahead and delete them because they don't seem to be affecting anything. Okay, so now we've got that. We've only got three objects and two nulls. We can ready to take this into Cinema 4D. So we're gonna go up to File in the top left, go to Export, Cinemax on Cinema 4D Exporter. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna make a brand new Cinema 4D file that we can open and use inside of Cinema. Let's jump into Cinema. Okay, so now we have Andrew's file opened up inside of Cinema and it looks a little different. So there's a couple of little things that we need to address before we, we can start modeling and doing our own thing. So we're gonna open up all these layers in the object panel on the right hand side. Let's just untwirl everything and we'll see what we're looking at. So we have a whole bunch of extruded layers that follow splines, which is fine. The one thing is it's going to make every extruded object or every cylinder that has an extrusion it's gonna set it at the default size. It won't recognize the pixel depth inside of After Effects. So we're just gonna try and adjust these to make it so they match what we need. So we're gonna reduce the top layer into a plane, just so it's nice and easy to reference where that top of that water should be. The axis shift and rotation, it's created some duplicate nulls here. So we can just actually delete those. And then you can always undo all this or import the project again if you mess anything up, so not a big deal. So we're gonna to go to this uh, rough glass outside and because it's set to 100 centimeters, but it's pointing in the wrong direction. So we're just gonna put these in the negative. So now I believe from Andrew's file, it was 800 centimeters. So we're gonna make that minus 800 centimeters. And we can just hide this for the moment until we need it again. The next one is the rough glass inside surface. So that would be the, the top of the water. So we'll do the same. I believe this one was around 500, but we have this top of the water reference here and it was minus 500. So if you know your dimensions, you can you don't have to bring in any of these references. You could just do the cylinders just to, to make sure they match. So this is the base file that I use to make the final file we're about to jump through and I'll walk through the volume builder. Okay, so now we're inside the final file that I used and the, the modeling. This was a cooking show. This is something we prepared earlier. And uh, so we're gonna walk through what all of these objects do. We have a remesher, we're gonna turn that off. We have a volume mesher, I'm gonna turn that off too. And now we're left with just a volume builder 
and I'm going to turn that off. So underneath all of this, we really have three cylinders that makes up that entire bottle. We have the main bottle body, which has a large amount of rounding on it. We have the neck, which is just a simple cylinder. And then we have a cork here that has taper deformer on it. And then we have the glass fluid, which is showing the inside of the bottle. And we're going to render this out so that Andrew can use it in compositing. I actually have, it's a bull. So it's a cylinder with a bull on it. The bull is just has this uh, a, a big a big square that's cutting out the top just so that we don't get the, any of this rotation from the cylinder. We don't want it to throw off any anything in the render. So I've actually got a cube that has a target tag, which is pointed straight at the camera. So the, the rotation shouldn't change too much, or at least it's less drastic than the actual reference. And the reason we want that is we want this edge of the water to come all the way up to the edge, and then Andrew's cell can go over the top of that. Okay, so let's close all this. I'm gonna walk through the volume builder here real quick. The volume builder is, I like to think of it like Play-Doh. You kind of like smashing pieces together and you kind of see what works. It's very intuitive, at least to me. You can get immediate feedback on changes that you've made. We have these two cylinders put together and I have them as union. So there's a couple of other options that you can, you can use. You can subtract, you can uh, intersect so that it'll only be the the middle two points. We're not going to go through all that today, but I would highly encourage you to play with it. The voxel size set to one centimeter. The way to think about this is like pixel resolution. So if you increase this to 10, we got ourselves an eight bit bottle, let's say it doesn't quite look like much. It's a little opposite to pixels because the, the higher the number, the lower the value. So if your computer is struggling to calculate this, what I would recommend is to raise this to a voxel size, I'm gonna slowly decrease this and you'll see the bottle come into shape. I would increase the voxel size until you can almost see what you're looking at. And then when you get to the final render, lower that down, see how you're at. But we're gonna set this to one because that's what the that's what our render already had. So that's the volume builder. There's a number of different ways you can edit these and alter them in some way. And it's with these deformers here. There's deformers inside of the volume builder that only act on volume objects. So we have SDF smooth, which just kind of adds padding to everything and welds, makes things look a little more like Play-Doh. We have dilate and erode, which uh, you can use as well. And we use close and open. And so what this does is it looks at the point, the sharp edge that we have here on the bottom, and it's going to add rounding to all these objects. And so let's turn it on. And so what it's done is add a little bit of rounding to that sharp corner, but you can really have fine control over this. So we've got it set to five centimeters here. I'm gonna increase it to 25 and we're gonna get a, something looks like a milk jug, I think. Yep, it looks like a milk jug. You can really have a lot of fun with this and depending on what your model is and what, your, what the look you're looking for, all these different deformers can add a lot of variation and kind of interest to your, to your models. So we're gonna reduce this back down to five centimeters. Okay, great. So this volume doesn't actually render. So if I try and render this right now, it's not gonna render. It's only rendering, it uh, looks like the inside of the bottle and the cork. So the reason for that is because volumes, they don't have any polygons to them. So that's what the, the volume measure does. And so if we turn that on, I've got this set to, I think this is all the defaults. So it's just voxel range is 50% and adaptive is set to zero. So the mesh here, is a little inconsistent. We've got these ring elements, which are pretty common in the volume modeling. And so what I like to do is to use the remesh object tool. And so let's turn that on. I think I have this set to mesh density 50% and the adaptiveness set to 100%. It's gonna take a second to think about that. And hey presto, we've got a model with consistent topology that all points in the right direction. If we were texturing this object, this would be a big boon for us because we can actually model this and do an, a UV unwrap on this because of the consistent topology. We're gonna start lighting the scene now. So we only need one light. So we've got an infinite light, which is only based on the rotation. So I can move this anywhere in the scene and it doesn't matter. The rotation is the only thing that really matters. You can get a lot of different looks by doing this. Got a little dance party going on here. It's a really simple lighting tool. And especially because we're using standard renderer here, so it's a pretty basic light, but for what our purposes, this is perfect. All we needed was just enough to catch the light on the other side of this bottle to sell the volume here. 
we really just, we rotated just enough because that's an edge light there and we have it pointing down just a little bit so it catches the other side. So now we're gonna move into rendering uh, and to make sure Andrew has everything he needs. Okay, I hope so far you're learning a little bit about how we can combine Cinema 4D, After Effects, and even Adobe Animate into one workflow. And as you've noticed, we're really just scratching the surface. If you want to go deep into Cinema 4D or After Effects, two courses that I personally have taken and highly recommend, Animation Bootcamp and Cinema 4D Basecamp. I've taken both of these courses and they were cornerstones in the foundation of my motion design career and self-education. Just go to schoolofmotion.com, click on the courses page, and scroll down until you see Animation Bootcamp or Cinema 4D Basecamp. And who knows, you might even have Bo or I as one of your TAs. All right, let's jump back into the project. So we have our, our bottle, we've got it lit, everything modeled, so now we need to move into rendering. There's only a couple of things we really need to do. So Andrew really just needs this lighting information here. I just hit Control R to pull up a quick preview render. And so he really just needs this light information here. And then he needs the information for the bottle and the cork to, to make sure that there's a mask there. So the a way that we can do that is we can create a, a Luma mat inside of After Effects using a object tag inside of Cinema 4D. We're gonna select that bottle and right click and go to render tags, compositing tag. So this object buffer, it essentially selects that object and makes it entirely white. So we're gonna enable it and we're gonna say our bottle is number one. So number two is this cork. If we hold down control, Click and drag, we can take a tag from one object and place it on another. And we can diselect the one and enable number two. And then the glass fluid is the next one. So we're gonna hold down control on the tag, click and drag, and we're gonna make number three. So disable two, enable three. The way we're gonna get this done is we're gonna go to the render settings, enable multipass, and go to multipass and add an object buffer. And so this group ID just needs to match that tag. So now we're gonna name this bottle and that's group ID one, and we need to add two more. So we're gonna add an object buffer for the cork. Spell it correctly, okay, and make it number two. And we're gonna do one more. We're gonna add another object buffer. I'm gonna call it water and make it number three. Let's go ahead and set up our saves here. In multi-pass, we're gonna make all these PNG sequences to make it as simple as possible. We just really need to name this something, something consistent. So we're gonna use a render token. And so if you press this little button here, there's a whole bunch of options. And what you're looking for is just the name that suits what you need to have. So mostly what I do is use a project token. So next one, is we're gonna add for the multi-pass down the bottom here. We're gonna add another one, my project name underscore, then add my pass. Okay, so now we have uh, all of our object passes set up. We have the name set up. So now we're just gonna do a quick little test render. So we'll make sure we're gonna go to our output settings here. 1080 by 1080 is okay. And then we're just gonna do one current frame. So if we select this, we hit, we hit render on one frame. So now we have our render done. We've got our white values here and we've also got the alpha. So if we select single pass, we can see all the different objects here. So we've got the alpha. So this is rendering with no background. We've got an object buffer, which just has the glass. We have the cork, which has just the cork isolated there, but our water isn't showing. What I would do or what we did for this project was I rendered a whole pass with just those settings. And then I went in and turned off the cork to reduce the visibility of this by holding down Alt and clicking on the visibility layer until it's done and turned off these and then rendered it again. Now that we've set that up, you can render one more time. It's gonna ask me to overwrite, preparing the file, and there you have it. This will be just the inside water of the bottle that Andrew can use as a, as a pass. So we're gonna set these up and get them rendered and then we're gonna jump into After Effects to get them composited. 
So now we've got all that rendered out. What we're going to do is bring these into After Effects, make sure that the comp length is correct and make sure the cell lines up and then we can hand it back to Andrew to do his compositing magic. I've just got a default version of After Effects open here, new file, and we're going to double click and go to our render folder. So we just have it, I've just got it on the desktop and we're going to import these. The one little tricky thing importing any sequence into After Effects, it always assumes a frame rate of 30 FPS. So if you're doing 24 or 12 or 18, you need to change this manually. If you right click the file, interpret footage, main, in the middle it says assume this frame rate, 30 frames, but we know that we want 12. So we're gonna change it to 12, hit okay. So that's our main sequence made, which is lovely. So we can actually use this as our base and create a new composition by dragging the sequence over the new composition window and it will match our timeline. So let's bring in all the other object passes and then uh, let's see if the cell lines up. Okay, so we have those imported now. We just need to change the interpretation to 12 for all of these again. So right click, interpret footage, main, 12. And so these are our object passes that we've set up and we'll show you how they look in a second. Let's add some folder structure, shall we? just to keep things nice and clean. Okay, so now let's click and drag these over. Now we've got the interpretation set up correctly and we have this white bottle. We're gonna set the mode on these to screen. So only the white values follows through. I call them bottle luma, because these are all luma mats. So we can use the white valley or Andrew will be able to use the white valley to mask out his graphics or if he has gradients or anything like that. So we can reuse these over and over. So then we've got the cork, cork, luma, and water. Also, let's import the cell just to double check that everything works here. Add a new folder, cell, and let's import that. Okay, so we imported the cell. We've changed the interpretation to 12 frames a second. So now we just need to click and drag this over. And it looks like uh, Andrew animated at 1920 by 1920, which is fine. Our final output was only 1080p, but uh, it's good to good to scale up. So now we can scale this down a little bit and let's see, let's see how it plays. There we go. Looks good to me. We're missing one frame. Oh, it's because our comp length's just a little too long. Okay, so we trim that down. That looks good to me. And then we use our bottle luma. Let's make sure these line up still. Good. Excellent. Okay, so now we're ready to hand this over to Andrew and he can do his compositing magic. All right, we have made it back into After Effects for compositing, which is where the style comes to life. And I'm gonna show you every single technique I use to achieve this final look. And I've broken it down into three main steps. The first step was establishing what base colors I wanted to use. So here's what the animation looks like after just stacking the surface, the liquid surface cell animation I did in animate on top of the bottle that Bo rendered. And I also added the bottom of the liquid to fill the rest of the bottle underneath it. So the first thing I did was to soften up the really hard rough edges from the cell animation and I added a fast box blur set to only one pixel just to add a little softness and then I dialed that back in using a simple choker so that it's still a semi hard edge and it when we back up to 100% resolution, it looks just fine. Next, I added a gradient ramp to go from a dark to a light, all black and white, and then CC toner so I'd have full control over the colors. Then lastly, and this actually happened later, I ended up adding a hue saturation effect to change the hue negative eight degrees because I thought it looked a little too magenta and this added a little bit more blue that I liked. Then after the liquid, I did a very similar process for the liquid body. Let me enable the effects. We have a gradient ramp, CC toner, and then the same hue saturation show, so it would shift to be the same color as the liquid surface. And for the main body of the bottle, if I enable the effects, you can see it's just a simple gradient ramp. But the problem here is that the cap is also affected, so I added another layer with just the cap. And let me show you exactly what's going on with that. That is the same render of the black cap and white body of the bottle that Bo sent, and I applied the extract effect to isolate just the cap. Now I have just the cap on alpha, so I can apply a fill, which is 
a little, it's a dark purple. And when we see this with everything else, I think it helps the cap stand out just a little bit. Next, we tackled the lighting. So I have this other render pass from Bo that is basically just the bottle with a rim light. And that's all I used for lighting this scene. So first, let's look at the rim light. This rim light, if I solo it, set the blend mode back to normal, and I'm gonna turn off all the effects. We see we have the light rim light on the black bottle. And for maximum control, the first thing I wanna do is make all the black transparent. So we only have the light on alpha. And that is exactly what the free plugin effect from Video Copilot called Color Vibrance does. I'll enable that. If you set the matte alpha mode to only, it essentially makes all the dark pixels transparent. And now that we have the rim light on alpha, and let me show you that against the rest of the bottle, there's a number of things we can do. And after exploring all the options that I could think of, I actually just ended up adding a fill color and setting the layer mode to add. Next, I added the fill light, and I actually used the same exact rim light render, and I'll show you that right here. I inverted the colors, so now the dark area is light and the rim light is dark, so that color vibrance will eliminate the rim light area. Now we have only the dark area, or the, in this case, the fill light on alpha. I added a color fill and set the blend mode to overlay. And while watching this back, I felt like the center of the bottle was getting a little bit too saturated with color. So I created a very simple radial gradient that is just hidden and locked at the bottom of the layer stack. And I used that as a luma mat to sort of dial down just the center of that fill light. For the background, I started with a very simple gradient in the color scheme, and here I felt like the bottle didn't pop quite enough, so I added a yellow radial gradient set to add mode so that the bottle would be more distinct, and I kind of like the interaction of the colors. And now the last step is really just these blooms, these glows that you see on the edge of the bottle right here and on the edge of the liquid, and they both use a very similar principle. Let me go ahead and solo just the bottle glow and turn up the opacity. So if I turn all this off, we see it's just our rim light render. I'm gonna turn on transparency. So again, separate out the rim light using VC color vibrance with the matte alpha set to only. I added a simple choker, restricting the alpha to only be at the core of where that rim light is showing up. Then I added a fast box blur to soften that out. And then of course, no motion project is complete without deep glow. And when I composite this set to add mode above everything else, here is what it looked like. I think it was at 15% opacity. So very subtle, but adds a nice little bloom. And for the shine that's on the liquid surface right here, that is just our good friend, CC Light Sweep. And you can see, that catches the edge of the alpha, and then I set the sweep intensity to zero and the edge intensity to 100. Then to polish it off, I added this fake bloom on top of that so that the edge really caught your eye. And that is just, again, the cell animation PNG. I added a fill so it was black. Then the CC light sweep so that it catches the edge of that alpha. Then I solid composite, which basically just adds a solid to the back of everything, set to black again, so that we would have more pixels to apply a deep glow. And I set that to the add mode, and that is at 100% opacity, and this is our final render. All right, hopefully now you feel comfortable enough implementing this workflow into your process, combining frame-by-frame -frame animation and 3D renders. If you like this video, we would appreciate a thumbs up. Also, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get notified when we release our next videos and keep up to date on all the After Effects and Cinema 4D news. Thanks for watching.